Uh, we're turning to Genesis chapter 6 tonight. Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> of course, this is the story of the flood. The, uh, really, it begins there. Well, chapter 6 is more about the cause of the flood, the building of the ark, and then in chapter 7, we get into the flood itself. But we're going to be spending some time in the opening verses of chapter 6 tonight. And I've decided to call a message, What Caused the Flood? What Caused the Flood? Genesis chapter 6 then, and verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and the Lord said I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. I guess most of us believe, uh, I think it's clear in the scriptures, that the flood of Genesis was a universal flood. It was a worldwide flood. It wasn't just a local flood. And that it destroyed all the flesh upon the earth, except for Noah and his family. Eight souls we read in Peter, and you can do the maths anyway in Genesis 6, and the animals that were saved in the ark. So we're, out, we're only now six chapters into Genesis, from the creation of Adam between 1,000 and 1,650 years. Uh, and we have a scene of destruction here, uh, which would beg a human description. Covered, might I dare say, almost euphemistically uh, in just three chapters of the scriptures. Now, the, pri the, the, the precise nature of the cause uh, of the flood has been endlessly contested by two schools of thought since the days of the apostles until the present. There was no doubt a steady growth of wickedness in the human race, as we find suggested by Cain and his children in chapter 4. But there's an event described in, these, in the opening verses of chapter 6, which is more offensive, I believe, to God than anything in previous human history, and it was this that precipitated the flood. And it's described in verse 2. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose now i've said that there's been a, a much contested view uh two essentially contesting views over these things since the days of the apostles and for all i know for all i know before that uh, and that concerns the identity of these two groups in this verse to the sons of god on the one hand and the daughters of men on the other uh, and the mention of this liaison reads in these verses as though it were the last straw. This was the culmination of a course of sinfulness that moved God to a fierce outpouring of his wrath. Um, and as I say, two opinions chiefly have prevailed since the time of the apostles regarding the identity of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And I'm, I will, as fairly as I can, give the substance of each view, um, setting one against the other. If we go, what I was going to do originally was give the one view and then give the other, but I... You know, it seems to be my way to put the two things in tandem and to compare them as we go. So uh, that's, what I, that's what I'm going to do. Now, some teach that the sons of God are the men of Seth's line. We read about Seth's descendants in chapter 5. We read about Cain's descendants in chapter 4. And there are those that teach that the sons of God are the men of Seth's line and the daughters of men are the women of Cain's line. Um, now, in chapter 4, you remember, we saw the descendants of Cain culminating in polygamy and possibly murder. And in chapter 5, we saw the line of Seth and noted the comparative godliness, especially of Enoch and Noah. So there's, 
So it might seem natural then in coming next to chapter 6 to suppose that the union spoken of in verse, verse 2, they took the wives of all which they chose, was between these two lines of descendants. That the godly Sethites, seduced by the ungodly Canaanite daughters, according to the one hypothesis, fell into compromise and married them. Um, now I've been studying a book all over the weekend, which I've greatly enjoyed, a comprehensive work on the subject called The Fallen Angels and the Heroes of Mythology by a guy called John Fleming, written in 1879. They wrote some great books in the 1800s, some of the best commentaries, some of the best uh, insights, some wonderful books in the 1800s. And this, in my view, was one of them. I was just gripped by it. I read it online, I read the whole thing, which is something I never do. I don't read stuff online, I'd rather have a, what we call a physical book. But this was so good, I read it online. But I have ordered a copy, it's a, it's a print on demand. If the print isn't minuscule, I'll put some in my shop, so if anybody interested, uh, The Fallen Angels and the Heroes of Mythology. And that, as I say, was published in 1879. And the one hypothesis um, says, therefore, that the sons of God are the descendants of Seth. Now, first of all, they are not called that in chapter 5. When we read of Seth and his descendants, nowhere are they described in chapter 5 as the sons of God. Um, secondly, if we check other, and we will in a moment, if we check other Old Testament occurrences of the expression, the sons of God, we discover that they are angels. And I'm already giving you a clue as to where I'm coming from. Let's just look at the references there in Job. Look at Job. And chapter 1. There's, there's three references in Job. We'll look at them all because they're only a verse each or so. Uh, verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6 of Job. Now there was a day when the sons of God came. This is exactly the same in the English and exactly the same in the Hebrew as it is in Genesis chapter 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And then in chapter 2 of Job, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And then come to Job 38, uh, verse 4. God is speaking here. We read in verse 1, the Lord answered Job. So this is the Lord speaking to Job here, verse 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, there's that phrase again, shouted for joy. Now, reading uh, John Fleming's book, he, he makes much of the fact that the Hebrew... And I, I can't pronounce Hebrew very well, but it's something like B'nai Ha Elohim is the expression used in Genesis 6. It's the expression used uh, in, in Job. Um, and that really, you know, is, is a very important um, observation to make, I think. And it seems to me, as I say, that this, that alone makes a strong case that the sons of God are not the men of Seth's line. Uh, you may not agree with me. You might, have, you might have looked at this subject in the past. You might have heard about it in the past. Uh, but over the many years, I've not found myself able to move from my position, which I'll make clear as we go. Secondly, I think in spite of some of the things I may have said over the last few weeks concerning chapter 4 and chapter 5, I think it's too broad a brush to assume that all of Cain's line were godless and all of Seth's line were godly. Um, you know, we read as we went through Seth's line, for example, that they, they had sons and daughters. They begat, Seth begat a son and he had other sons and daughters. Uh, you know, Enoch begat a son and he had other sons and daughters. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's pure assumption to suppose everybody in, this, in Seth's line was godly and everybody in Cain's line was ungodly, though perhaps I might have given you that impression. There are many, many children on both sides that are not named. Uh, and Seth's line anyway might more accurately be described as the messianic line. We have that line traced through Seth because this was the line, Noah comes of this line, Shem, Ham and Japheth. We then have Abraham coming from, from Shem, the Semitic tribes and so forth, coming right up through Judah to the Lord Jesus. So that, that line is important to be traced. But more than anything else, more than calling it a godly line, it's the messianic line. 
the line through which Jesus was to come. Uh, and is it reasonable that all Seth's other descendants were godly or all Cain's other children were ungodly? Further all, furthermore, we know that all of Seth's children perished in the flood along with Cain's. So we would have to assume that they all of them, except for Noah and his family, they all sank from godliness to ungodliness. Um, and so that would suggest the complete failure of the godliness in Seth's children too. Children's too. Children, Seth's children too. And furthermore, the language I think of verses 1 and 2 doesn't fit with what I will call the Sethite interpretation. If you haven't seen where I'm coming from yet, what I'm saying is, one interpretation says that the sons of God were the children of Seth, the descendants of Seth. And the other interpretation which I believe is that they were fallen angels. They were angels that fell, as Job describes them, uh, when he speaks of sons of God. And I think that uh, what I might call the Sethite in interpretation doesn't fit with verses 1 and 2. Let's just read verses 1 and 2 again. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now would we be right to assume that the men that multiplied in verse 1 were all of Cain's line? It seems unlikely that men refers to both, it refers to all the men. So if it refers to all the men in verse 1 it seems to me to stretch to make it mean only Cain's daughters uh, in verse 2. It must, when it says men began to multiply, it must surely apply to Seth's line as much as Cain's. The daughters of men now in verse 2 reasonably applies to Sethite as well as to Cainite women. If sons of God are angels, fallen angels in verse 2, the forced interpretation that the daughters of men must be Cainites is answered, if you see, if you see where I'm coming from with that. Look at verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now the giants these days are often referred to as Nephilim, which is the Hebrew word, translated giants. And they are clearly the offspring of this union of fallen angels or sons of God with human women. Now there is nothing in chapter 5 to suggest that Seth's line were giants and there's nothing in chapter 4 to suggest that Cain's daughters were giants. The normal union of men and women such as Sethites and Cainites would not produce giants. To avoid this difficulty those who favour the Sethite interpretation retranslate giants as tyrants um, or they don't translate it at all and just give the Hebrew word Nephilim. So, for example, if you pick up the NIV, the ASV, the ESV, they all say Nephilim in verse 4. They don't translate the word. Uh, they say Nephilim in verse 4. And only by a comparison in those modern Bibles with Numbers 13, 33, you might note it. I wouldn't recommend you turn there now, but there's nothing to stop you. Uh, but Numbers 13, 33 is where the spies are sent into the land and they describe the giants that they saw um, and the word Nephilim is used there. Now in a modern Bible, if you compare Numbers 13 with uh, chapter 6, you might get the message that you get simply from reading chapter 6 in the AV. If we ask, were, any, were there any giants who were, uh, uh, that is of great stature in the scriptures, of course there were. Goliath, Og, Ishbibinob, I think was his name, and, and many others. The sons of Anak. They are giants. They are men of gigantic stature. They're there in the scriptures. And again, it seems to me if, you know, that this simple statement that they're called giants in chapter 4 is very difficult to square with a set of, with a set of view. Of course, what happens so often, um, in so much of the stuff you pick up, you get this, well, this is a poor translation. Uh, you know, our English verse says this, but we now know that the Hebrew should be translated so on and so forth, which is a line I will not take. Um, I really firmly believe that you know an ordinary individual that knows nothing about Hebrew or Greek, uh, really even not necessarily of extraordinary intelligence, will get the right picture if he just reads the text as it is and believes what it says. As I went through Fleming and I did enjoy it, you know, was batting the arguments to and forth. Um, but what came, what was the, under, the, the sort of thing that was coming to me, I was reading, I thought, if you just read the English text, you'll get the right. He's going through all these Hebrews scholars and comparing one with the other and the Greek scholars and the Latin 
And I thought, if you just read the English, you'll get the conclusion that it's coming to. Um, and we read of them, the same became mighty men, in verse 4, these giants, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now that looks to me, and it has done for many and many years, like the reference to the gods of the Greeks and Romans, men of renown. Another very good book called Earth's Earliest Ages by G.H. Pember uh, has this to say, quote, The children of these unlawful connections before the flood were the renowned heroes of old. The subsequent repetition of the crime doubtless gave rise to the countless legends of the loves of the gods and explains the numerous passages in the classics as well as in the ancient literature of other languages in which human families are traced to a half-divine origin. Demigods is the word that they are that's often used, unquote. Another of the common objections to the idea of angel and human intercourse, sexual intercourse, uh, is often raised by the, the Sethite school of thought, and that would take us to Matthew 22, so let's go there. <coughs> Matthew 22, this is a, a passage that's used, a verse that's used very often by those that hold to the view that the sons of God were the children of Seth, they would take you to Matthew 22. The Lord Jesus is speaking in verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now, the first difficulty to my mind with the Sethite view in the employment of this verse is the last two words, in heaven. The Lord Jesus is not talking about fallen angels here. He's talking about angels that are in heaven. Um, in another one of the Gospels, I'm not sure whether we will look at it in a moment or two, uh, he speaks of them as being in heaven at the time of his speaking. Now, um, if man who has a sexual dimension loses it when he goes to heaven, when we get saved, we become as the angels, we neither marry or are given in marriage. So if mankind do, and, and saved people, of course, saved men and women, lose that sexual dimension when we get resurrected and into the glory, uh, may not an angel find it reversed when he falls down to earth? Is that not possible? Pember again from Earth's earliest ages says this, quote, We should perhaps notice the most common objection to our interpretation, which is that angels, as spiritual beings, could not take wives of the daughters of men. We are, however, unable to recognise the cogency of such an argument because those who advance it lay claim to a more intimate acquaintance with the angelic nature than we can concede as possible. You'll find in many of the old interpretations they discuss the nature of angels and Pemberley is saying they don't know. Many of them say angels have no material form, they couldn't possibly unite with women, because they don't, but they don't know that. They assert it, but they don't know it. This is what Pember's saying. Have a look at Mark chapter 12. I'm moving through this much more quicker than, quickly than I thought I would, but that's okay. Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 25. And here again, the Lord Jesus is... Uh, He's saying much what he said in Matthew that we've just read together. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And I would maintain that there is a difference between the angels which are in heaven and the angels which fell. Uh, the angels that committed the sin, as we shall see, are now, as in Jesus' day, in hell. One of the interesting, there was a, a lot of interesting bypaths that uh, Fleming goes into in his book, uh, it was apparently, it's been a, a very ancient belief held by the Jews before the early church, but also amongst early church fathers, that the devils, what modern, modern Bible's called demons, but the ABA always calls them devils, are actually the spirits of those fallen angels. I'm not going to press that point. Um, but those that originally fell, the sons of God, they are, as we shall see later, they are in hell at the present time. They are not on the loose. I, Satan and his angels are a different bunch altogether. Though they have fallen, we're talking about distinctive and separate groups here. And I, with that will perhaps become clearer a bit later on. Um, now, if you've not heard any of this before, you might be tempted to think it's a flight of fancy. I have to be so careful because, uh, you know, the, human nature likes the weird. Human nature likes to, to take the strange view. 
Uh, and I have, to, I have to fight this because I'm probably more guilty of that than most perhaps. Uh, but as I, you know, over many, many years have looked at this and battled it backwards and forwards, it seems to me that I think I have the right interpretation here. But of course, I just commend that to your judgment. You make your own decision. Um, so as I say, you might be tempted to think it's a flight of fancy, but the belief I hold is that certain angels before the flood in rebellion against God, descended from heaven and copulated with human women. Now, this sin against nature produced giants who were notoriously violent and godless. The Israelites met with a post-flood reoccurrence of them in Canaan, uh, and they were commanded to destroy them utterly. It's interesting, you notice, in some of the cities they were went to, they were to spare the virgin women, they were to spare the children, but in other cities they were told you are to destroy everything that breathes, man, woman and child. And I would suggest that was because there was this bloodline still somewhat in some of those Canaanite cities. Uh, perhaps you can give me another answer, but that's, that seems to me the answer. Uh, you know, that, that, that such was the corruption of some of the cities of Canaan that they were to be wiped out totally. Um, now, Though varying perhaps as to some details, the fallen angel view of Genesis 6 goes right back to apostolic times. So this is not, uh, you know, what someone called a novel upstart doctrine I'm presenting you tonight. Uh, until about the fourth century, it was a prevalent view of Christian leaders and contemporary historians and philosophers of those days. The change to the Sethite view happened around about the fourth century, and Fleming goes into the reasons which I won't do tonight. Uh, and really all through the, the ascendancy of Rome, from the 4th century right to, the, to about the 18th, the prevailing view was that sons of God are the Sethites. And it's possibly still the prevailing view today. Certainly, most likely in the Reformed school. Um, because, you know, and, and, and this is not a criticism, but, you know, the Reformed guys, generally speaking, uh, they like everything to be, you know, literal. Um, and anything that's, you know, uh, how can I describe it? Anything that doesn't seem quite rational, they're inclined, they're inclined not to touch. Um, but John Fleming lists, for example, Josephus and Philo of the first century. They held this view. Tertullian, one of the church fathers of the second to the third century. Justin Martyr, who died 167 AD, held this view. Athenagoras, second century. Irenaeus, Tatian, Clement, all second century. Julius Africanus and the Clementine Homilies, third century. And Lactantius of the fourth. Uh, presumably there were more, but these were the ones he mentions. Quite well-known church fathers, philosophers, historians in the first four centuries held the view that the sons of God were actually fallen angels. Much more important, though, uh, and ending the debate, as far as I'm concerned, are the testimonies, testimonies of the apostles Peter and Jude. So let's look at those. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter and chapter 2. And we'll read from verse 4. It will be well to re read a few verses here. So, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to reserve them to judgment. Can I just pause there and say, you see, these angels are not on the loose. These angels are in chains, reserved unto judgment. Verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day, with their unlawful deeds. Some of us know how he feels, don't we? Verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. So in verses 4 and 5, we've got one situation, I believe, uh, that concerns the flood. And in verses 6 and 7, we've got another situation having to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. And in each of those two situations, the flood on the one hand and Sodom and Gomorrah on the other, we have judgment stated first and mercy stated afterwards. So, for example, uh, verse 4 speaks of judgment on the angels, but mercy upon Noah. 
And then in verses 6 and 7, verse 6, you've got the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, but the mercy upon Lot. Um, so verses 4 and 5 are the same event. At the time that Noah was spared, there was a judgment upon the angels that sinned. And the sin also in both events is summarised then in verse 10, chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Now, if you've ever... Uh, I'm sure, well, I'm sure you've read Peter, um, you know, I'm sure you've read it many, many times, I've heard it preached so many, many times, and you've heard Jude too. But it struck me many, many years ago, reading those two books, how very similar they are. So similar, in fact, is Jude's letter, and, and particularly the second chapter of Peter, that it, it's not at all unreasonable, and this is not to take away the truth of inspiration, that either Jude was reading Peter when he wrote, or Peter was reading Jude, and um, we'll see this. Uh, in a moment. Let, we, in fact, let's see it now. Let's go to Jude. Remember, it's the last but one book, John Jude Revels. John, John Jude Revels. Um, just a couple of verses from Jude. And I say again, if you will take a moment at your leisure to read Jude and to read the second chapter of Second Peter, I think you'll agree with me that one of them was certainly reading the other. That is not to say that one of them was not inspired. You know, when Matthew wrote the genealogy, maybe he had access to Jewish records, but he still wrote on the inspiration of God. And so it seems clear to me that they were, they were reading, one of them was reading the other, and they're talking about the same events. Verse 6 then of Jude. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved, here it is again, in everlasting chains, under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. These angels were not loose in the air like those of, of Ephesians 6 when Jude writes this verse 7 even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire uh, so Jude, Jude only mentions the judgment here he doesn't mention Noah and he doesn't mention Lot um, but the same two events, it seems to me, are in, are in view. One, the flood, and secondly, Sodom and Gomorrah. And if the flood's in view in Jude, the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation is reserved in everlasting chains of the darkness and the judgment of the great day. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as I say, the angels, when Jude speaks of the angels which kept not their first estate, he's strongly likely, particularly with the comparison with Peter to referring to flood days. Furthermore, in verse 7, Jude says that the Sodomites, in like manner, that is, in like manner to the fallen angels, went after strange flesh. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and this is about them, in like manner, in like manner to what? In like manner to the angels, of verse 6, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That's what the angels did, I believe. Now, <coughs> That suggests too, and we can't go down this line too far tonight, that the Sodomites actually went, went further than sodomy because as gross and offensive as sodomy is, it's not strange flesh. Uh, for more details on that, you might like to make a note for your leisure of Leviticus 18, verses 23 and 24. Uh, but you might say, Colin, this was all three to 4,000 years ago. It's history. Why trouble us with it? Well, in the first place, it's in Scripture. Uh, and that you know, as we go through and we look at the, the flood story, it's a very, it's one of the one of those accounts that I find very sobering, and uh, you know, it's one of those things that prompts me very much to want to get out and win the lost, because I believe that just as that devastating, unexpected, and, uh, and dreadful judgment fell, we're just on the brink of another one. The Lord promised that He wouldn't destroy the earth by flood, but He didn't say anything about not destroying it by fire. Uh, that will ultimately, of course, be after the millennium, but we know there will be fire and hail and so forth and hailstones and, and all sorts of horrors during the tribulation. So you might say, well, OK, but apart from that, why, why trouble us with these things? Why, why are you telling us about angels? Uh, let's go to Matthew 24. <coughs> Matthew 24. And we'll read just a few verses here. The Lord Jesus is talking about the times at the end of the tribulation when he returns here. 
We'll get into this, God willing, we'll get into some of this on our prophecy session, a prophecy seminar, because I'm hoping to look at the rapture. There's all sorts of strange views about the rapture. I don't think this is the rapture of the church here, but that, that's not for tonight. Uh, this is at the end of the tribulation. So we're in Matthew 24, we're looking at verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. <coughs> First of all, the Lord Jesus says that when he comes at the end of the tribulation, the days shall be as were the days of Noah. The days of Noah are described in those few verses we read at the opening of chapter 6. Now, it might be argued, and I tried to look at it in this sense, that the Saviour is simply saying that men and women will be totally surprised uh, as they go about their lawful business, eating, drinking, marrying, giving marriage, that just as they were totally surprised by the sudden fall of, of rain, by the sudden coming of the flood, so they will be totally surprised when he comes himself. But I think something more is alluded to by the references to eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. If we look at Genesis 6 to see if we can put Jesus' words into context, the only marriages mentioned there are the sons of God with the daughters of men. So you read about marriage in Genesis 6, you're reading about the sons of God took their wives of the daughters of men of all which they chose. And the Lord Jesus is saying, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. And that in the days of Noah was the corruption of the human race by fallen angels. And we are now, like never before, seeing the institution of marriage corrupted. I think things are just starting. It's as horrendous as it is, I feel it will get worse. Uh, there are those in the USA now, for all I know over here, but certainly the USA, who no longer want to have male and female on birth certificates. They think that, that's out of date, you know. The, the whole concept of uh, boys and girls, you know, uh, being recognised by their various appendages or lack of them at birth is, is, is outmoded, by, according to some of these people. And sadly, you know, so many of our leaders over here, I should be talking about Obama in a moment, over in America, they swallow all this stuff. Maybe they take it on board because they want to be popular and they want to get voted in. Uh, but we are, I think we're going to th see things get... God help us and take us away first. But if not, I think we're going to see things get worse. And so we are now, like never before, seeing the concept of marriage degraded. It was, it was David Cameron who pushed the same-sex marriage bill through, of course, as you know. Uh, and I find that Barack Obama is every bit as corrupt, if not more so, and possibly more so. I came across, I sent it to Paul in the week, I, I came across a clip of Barack, Barack Obama speaking at a fundraiser, uh, what's called an LGBT fundraiser, we sometimes call that lettuce, gay, bacon and tomato, but you know what LGBT means. Speaking at, in t June 2014, on my birthday I think it was, as it happened, um, at this LGBT fundraiser, um, and, he, and he said this, and I'm quoting him verbatim, this is what he said, quote, Barack Obama, quote, when I took office, only two states had marriage equality. Today, 19 states and the District of Columbia do. There are court rulings pending in other states as well. And I, you know, the response I will give in the words of Shakespeare, there was a, there was a, a, a loud cheer uh, from the gathered crowd, but I thought of Shakespeare's words when, when Julius Caesar was offered a crown the rabblement hooted and clapped their chapped hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath. It went down a storm, you know, when, when Barack Obama came out with all this nonsense. He is more slick even than Bill Clinton, they used to call him Slick Willie. Barack Obama's even more slick than Slick Willie. He delivers his speech with a real cocky air and a certain amount of presidential panache. I'm sure that's what many find appealing about Obama, the cocky, swaggering, panache-filled way he delivers his speeches. And it occurred to me he's riding upon a tidal wave of popular model sewage on the surfboard of political correctness. America is going down and Great Britain is going down while such men lead. 
And we voted that man in again. I don't think, whatever, whether you're Conservative, uh, UKIP, whatever you are, Labour, whatever you are, we should never have voted that man in again. And I always think of, of uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12 is a great psalm that KJV defenders use, where it talks about the, Lord's, the words of the Lord are pure words. But the last verse of that psalm uh, has a lot to say about government and men like uh, Barack Obama and David Cameron. And the last verse of 12, uh, Psalm 12, verse 8 says, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. If you've got vile men in leadership, you've got the wicked walking on every side. The country always gets the government it deserves. You know, there's no question about that. I sometimes tune into a, an alternative news source uh, because I don't trust the BBC, the Bias Broadcasting Corporation, as far as I could throw any of them. And I tend to tune into an alternative news source, but they can't see beyond politicalism, you know, political views. And they always tend to talk about the ordinary people, the good people. If there were more good people and ordinary people as these folks seem to think, we wouldn't have the governors we've got. The fact that the nation is corrupt, the people only thinking about themselves, is the reason we've got men like Cameron and the other smarmy army uh, that we've got in, in the House of Commons. Commons. Moral corruption is the harbinger of political overthrow. I've said that many times and I never forget that. It just fits in exactly. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. One final modern and very telling connection with the days of Noah and I'm finished. Uh, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Just linking again what the Lord Jesus says about the days of Noah, the times when he comes, and what we find in Daniel with regard to our times. Or certainly times as they shall be when the Lord returns. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel's interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the great image with the head of gold and the, the, uh, the chest of silver, the loins of brass and the legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. Daniel interprets it and he says this, chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Um, notice that expression I emphasise, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In the days of the twelve toes, which is at the end of the times of the Gentiles, the twelve toes? This is strange, it must have been Goliath. At the days of the ten toes, uh, we have, the, we have the Lord returning here uh, and it speaks of the end times of the Gentiles when the Lord returns and in the book of the Revelation we find it represented as ten horns on the beast ten kings uh, and clearly we have beings according to Daniel 2 and 43 who are not human they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men have a look quickly with me to Leviticus 19 and 19 Leviticus 19, 19. I might preach on this Saturday. Don't know for sure yet, but uh, it's a text that's got a lot of, uh, lot of applications. Leviticus 19, 19. <clears throat> you shall keep my statutes. They shall not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. They shall not sow thy field with mingled seed. There's that word, mingled, with reference to seeds again. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. God hates mixture, Pat Curry used to say. God hates mixture. Uh, we could, we, we, maybe we all look at this Saturday night. Maybe, the Lord willing, maybe we'll do that. But we have a mingled seed here. God doesn't like mingled seed. What, not, what do we find in Daniel 2.43? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now, any way you cut that in the authorised version, whoever they are, they're not men. That's what the King James Bible says. Um, and I, and I, I see this in conjunction with Matthew 24 as a repeat of the sin of the days of Noah. And needless to say, and, and finally, the modern versions drop the ball here as they drop the ball all over the place. 
in, in uh, Daniel 2 and 43. The NIV, for example, says in Daniel 2, 43, and just as you saw the iron uh, mixed with, sorry, linked, mixed, sorry, mink, mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. That's a totally different sense altogether. They've just, they've just taken out the idea that you find in the King James Bible. Now, if you don't want to stick with the King James Bible, that's between you and the Lord. But the reason I hold the interpre interpretation I hold is because that's what the King James Bible says. Now, you might feel that I've... Maybe you might feel that I've, I've twisted one or two of these scriptures. Or I don't think I have. Uh, but certainly what happens, you know... And I looked at also the ESV, uh, and I think it was the New American Standard, and they messed this verse up as well. And they put Nephilim in, they changed giants to Nephilim. They all say Nephilim, which is not a translation. Uh, you know, so you, you find it very difficult to come in, come, come into any real conclusions. A bit like trying to trying to read a, a commentary by some of these Hebrew guys. You know, some of the some of the people that the Banner of Truth published. The guy who wrote a book on Daniel, and it's absolutely indecipherable. It's full of German, and you know, I don't know who he wrote it for. Maybe one of the professors at his college. And you find that with Keelan Dillich. Keelan Dillich is useful, but so often they will change what the text says if it doesn't quite square with a, with a perfectly reasonable and rational and normal way of looking at things. And uh, that's why, you know, if they change my Bible, I'm having nothing to... I don't care how clever they are, I'm not interested. And, you know, if you think otherwise, that's between you and the Lord. Now, who knows how bad things will be before the rapture, but it's looking pretty grim to me. Mm. Um, and we're well on the way. We've, with men like Obama in government in the States and Cameron over here, and, uh, you know, we're well on the way. We must... We must keep our eyes on the Lord. Enoch kept his eyes on the Lord. Um, as, as dark as those days were, you remember Enoch was the man who walked with the Lord and God, it, God took him, he was raptured. He's a picture of the rapture of the church, I'm sure. He kept his eyes on the Lord. Uh, and that's what we need to do. We could get depressed, couldn't we? We could, we could, you know, we could look at Islam, we could look at Romanism, we could look at the UN. Uh, oh dear, the UN, my daughter, she wants to work for the UN, please God. <laughs> Interfe yeah, intervene, that's, that's the last place, that's even worse than the European Central Bank. Um, you know, they're just corrupt institution. But we get our eyes on the Lord, and we stay cheerful, we can still sing. Uh, and we can still be, you know, contented and joyful. I'm due to preach in a church, I won't tell you where, next uh, Sunday. I don't know what I'm going to say to them, because they're the most miserable people you ever saw in all your life. However they expect anybody to join their church, I really don't know. I've never been in such a miserable place. I've, I've known more cheerier funerals, believe me. Um, and what happens is if you, look, if you keep looking at the situation around you and you keep whining over how few there are in your church, you're going to get out. Keep your eyes on the Lord. A brother I used to correspond with in prison in the USA sent me a letter once and he said, knees on the floor, nose in the Bible, eyes on Jesus. I never forgot that. Knees on the floor, nose in the Bible, eyes on Jesus. And we'll sing, won't we? And we'll keep, we'll keep some buoyancy and we'll, we'll have some joy in our lives. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Next week, God willing, then we're going to get into the building of the ark. Um, so thanks for coming. Amen.